Hi everyone, welcome back. Uh, so we're going to continue on with our discussions on the synthesis of alcohols. Uh, we've already reviewed uh, some of the reactions that we, that we previously learned. Uh, uh, and uh, for the new set of reactions, what we're going to do is uh, we will be talking about the synthesis of alcohols from carbonyl compounds, okay, carbonyl compounds. When we say carbonyl compounds, we are referring to aldehydes and ketones. So an aldehyde or a ketone would serve as the starting material for synthesizing an alcohol in these reactions that we're going to learn. Now, these reactions <coughs> overall uh, would qualify as a reduction, okay? These are reduction reactions in a general sense. And so that could be confusing as to like, okay, how is that a reduction, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to spend the first few minutes actually talking about uh, oxidation states and how do we understand the oxidation state of carbon in organic compounds. It's very simple, okay? Uh, now you've learned about oxidations and reductions uh, in general chemistry, okay? And the basic definition of uh, an oxidation or a reduction is no different from what you've learned in Gen Chem, okay? Uh, an oxidation is a loss of electrons. A reduction, on the other hand, is the gain of electrons. Uh, but in organic chemistry, uh, it's much simpler to track oxidations and reductions. Uh, we can track uh, a, a reaction as to whether it's an oxidation or reduction just based on uh, the number of hydrogen atoms or maybe the number of oxygen atoms or uh, the number of carbon oxygen bonds, things like that, okay? So an oxidation is also the loss of hydrogens. So if there's a reaction going on where we are removing some hydrogens from a reactant and getting to the product, then we could formally call it an oxidation in some sense. And similarly, the reduction is the gain of hydrogens, okay? So loss of hydrogens meaning, again, just to clarify, this is they are removed and here they are added. And in terms of an oxygen atom, okay, uh, the gain of oxygen, Okay, that means the addition of oxygens to a molecule is considered an oxidation. And on the other hand, the loss of oxygen, okay, which is the removal of oxygen is considered a reduction. So we can, uh, so in some sense in organic chemistry, an oxidation or a reduction reaction can be very visual because when I look at the structure of a molecule, I can track, or when I look at, the, look at a reaction, I can track whether hydrogens are being added or removed, and I can say whether it's a formal sort of oxidation or reduction type of a reaction, or I can track the number of oxygens being added or removed, and I can say whether it's an oxidation or reduction. Now, uh, sometimes, uh, coming to this oxygen uh, aspect of it, the gain may not be of an oxygen atom as such, like maybe you're not adding an oxygen atom, but this gain could be also be like an increase 
in the number of carbon, uh, the number of bonds between a carbon and oxygen connected to it. Okay, so it could just be a change, uh, an increase in the number of bonds between a carbon atom and an oxygen that is connected to it. So let's look at a very simple example here. So let's say we have a molecule where we have, uh, I'm just going to give you a very general molecule. So if we have a molecule like this, which is an alcohol, there is a carbon atom here and in this molecule, there's a single bond between the carbon and the oxygen atom. If this molecule is converted into a carbonyl compound, okay, if it's connected to a carbonyl compound, uh, you notice how there was a single bond previously. Now in the product, there's a double bond between the carbon and the oxygen atom. So this would represent an oxidation because we have increased the number of bonds between the carbon atom and the oxygen that it was connected to. Okay, there was one bond and now there are two bonds. It's a single bond versus a double bond. So this is a oxidation. Now, if you wanna track it based on the number of hydrogens, notice how there was a hydrogen on the oxygen here. There was a hydrogen on the carbon, which is not shown because it's a bond line structure. But in the product, there, the hydrogen on the oxygen is gone. The hydrogen on the carbon is gone because the carbon now has a double bond. So that's four bonds total. Okay. So there's a loss of hydrogen atom. So this is also oxidation in that sense. Okay. And so similarly, uh, as far as reduction is concerned, this could be a decrease in the number of bonds between a carbon and an oxygen connected to it, okay? So we could pretty much think about the reverse of this reaction. So when you go from, let's say, a carbonyl compound, okay, there's a carbon oxygen double bond. If I do a reaction and if I convert that double bond into a single bond, okay, this is a reduction now. So this would be an oxidation and this is a reduction, okay? So in organic chemistry, like I said, we don't really have to uh, keep track of the number of electrons uh, lost or the number of uh, electrons gained. It is very visual when you look at the structures of molecules, as long as you track the number of hydrogens or maybe the number of oxygens added, removed, or it could be the number of bonds between a carbon atom and a specific oxygen that it's connected to. Okay, so it's a more visual thing here and it makes this whole process easy because we will be talking about uh, oxidations and reductions uh, in several upcoming uh, topics. Okay, so from carbonyl compounds, as you can see, when an alcohol is synthesized from a carbonyl compound, this is a carbonyl compound. When it is synthesized from a carbonyl compound, the reaction is a reduction because it results in a decrease in the number of bonds between that carbon and the oxygen, okay? You start with double bond in the carbonyl compound and a single bond in the alcohol. Okay. Now let's look at the reagents that would allow us to do this reaction. And we're going to learn about a couple of reagents here that all, that would all allow us to do this transformation, convert a carbonyl compound into an alcohol. Okay. Uh, the first reaction that would do this, uh, again, sorry, I should not have that. 
Okay, so we are talking about syntheses from carbonyl compounds. Okay, these are all reduction reactions. Okay, the first one that would do this is a hydrogenation, okay, hydrogenation. Now this hydrogenation is similar to the hydrogenation of alkenes that you've previously encountered. So it requires hydrogen gas and it requires a catalyst, okay? So this is similar to hydrogenation of alkenes. Uh, the difference here is it requires more forcing conditions. So when I mean, uh, when I say forcing conditions, I'm referencing to maybe uh, a higher temperature, okay? Uh, higher H2 gas pressure, etc. okay? So the conditions that actually make this reaction happen. But the reaction itself is straightforward. So if I were to show this, so let's say if we have a ketone. So if you start with a ketone, uh, and this reaction would apply to an aldehyde also, but I'm using a ketone as a representative example here. So if we start with a ketone, and if we react the ketone with hydrogen gas, and similar to the hydrogenation of alkenes, we need uh, a catalyst for doing this, okay? So we'll need a, plat a, pl a platinum maybe, or it could be a palladium, or other metals are possible, okay? Platinum or palladium, uh, catalyst is needed. Uh, platinum or palladium catalyst. And when we do this hydrogenation, you're adding hydrogens. So it's a reduction, okay? we will get the alcohol. So essentially one hydrogen added to the oxygen, the other hydrogen added to this carbon. That's how we got the single bond. So, but the carbon oxygen double bond became a carbon oxygen single bond. So it's a net reduction and we can convert uh, a carbonyl compound. Okay, so read this as a carbonyl compound into an alcohol, okay? That's the thing. Uh, and uh, like I said, I haven't specifically given any numbers here, but these are conditions that we require for doing this uh, hydrogenation are more forcing uh, than what you require for the hydrogenation of alkenes, okay? More forcing relative to the hydrogenation of alkenes. Okay, uh, the second, reagent actually that will allow us to do this reduction reaction convert a carbonyl compound into uh, an alcohol okay the second reagent and this is uh, i would say like the simplest or the easiest reagent that can be used for doing this reaction is by using sodium borohydride Sodium borohydride is relatively cheap, okay? Sodium borohydride. This is a very, uh, it's relatively cheap compared to the other methods that we're, uh, that we're learning. So it's easier to do compared to the hydrogenation that we saw. We'll be seeing another reagent and this is cheaper and again, easier to do compared to that reagent. Uh, so sodium borohydride, okay? This is a 
source of nucleophilic H minus, which is hydride. Now we've previously seen sodium hydride, okay, Na plus and H minus. Sodium hydride is a base. Okay, the hydride here, okay, this hydride, it is not a source of it is not a source of nucleophilic hydride. So we cannot use sodium hydride for doing this reaction, but sodium borohydride can be used for doing, doing this reaction. Now I want to uh, talk uh, very briefly about the bonding in sodium borohydride also. So NaBH4, this is essentially Na plus and uh, BH4 minus with a negative formal charge on that boron, okay? Uh, now, if you think about boron, uh, boron based on its valency, it can form bonds with three hydrogen atoms, okay? And that would be all, okay? Uh, it can make three uh, bonds there. Uh, but at this point, when boron forms three bonds uh, with three hydrogen atoms, uh, its octet is not complete. This boron is at six. Uh, this is at six electrons, okay, as far as the boron is concerned. So, the boron can, in principle, complete its octet, and to do that, what it can do is it can take up an H minus. Okay, so another H minus. So this boron we call the boron Lewis acidic. And again, recollect a Lewis acid is an electron acceptor. It can accept electrons. Okay, so this is a Lewis acidic or the other term that we learned earlier is electrophilic. It's an electrophile because it likes electrons. Okay, so it can react with uh, more hydrogens. Now, this is not an electron push arrow. I was just giving you the electron count for that boron. So the hydride, like another hydride can actually come and attack that boron because this is a Lewis acid, it's an electrophile. So hydride can come and attack it and we can get to the species where the boron now has four hydrogens around it. And now the boron would have a negative formal charge to it. And that formal charge is neutralized by the counter ion sodium. So that gives us a sodium borohydride. So that's just a very, uh, very, very brief uh, explanation of what this molecule is. And now once we have this molecule, the sodium borohydride technically can serve as a source of four hydrides, okay? Uh, this can serve as a source of four hydride, uh, four hydride ions. Okay, in principle, we can do that because there are four hydrogens on it. Okay, uh, so now let's look at the mechan uh, like, like look like look at the reaction uh, and how this reaction is done. You know, how do we use sodium borohydride? So. If I have a carbonyl compound and I want to convert this into the alcohol, I can react this carbonyl compound with sodium borohydride, NaBH4, and this reaction is usually done in a polar, 
protic solvent. And a good example or good examples are alcohols in general. So we could use methanol or ethanol. So you could use ETOH, okay, uh, anything. But any alcohol in principle can be used as a solvent for these uh, for the sodium borohydrate reduction. These are common examples that are used for doing the sodium borohydrate reduction. And when you do this, uh, it converts the carbonyl compound into the corresponding alcohol. The carbonyl compound is converted into the corresponding alcohol. Okay, now, if this carbonyl compound is an aldehyde, okay, if the carbonyl compound is an aldehyde, then this reaction would convert the aldehyde into a primary alcohol. If the carbonyl compound is a ketone, then the ketone is converted into a secondary alcohol, okay? So you can convert aldehydes to primary alcohols and ketones to secondary alcohols. You won't be able to make a tertiary alcohol by using sodium borohydride, uh, starting from carbonyl compounds. We'll see another reaction that will allow us to do uh, that, okay, convert a carbonyl compounds into uh, tertiary alcohols, okay? So primary and secondary alcohols are fine. They can both be synthesized starting from an appropriate a carbonyl compound, aldehydes to primary alcohols, ketones to secondary alcohols. Uh, let's look at some specific examples here. So if I have An aldehyde, okay, that's an aldehyde. If I react it with sodium borohydride using methanol as a solvent, then this carbon, which is an aldehyde right now, okay, that carbonyl carbon is what's converted into the alcohol. This double bond O becomes an OH. Uh, and we have two hydrogens here. Okay, so we get a primary alcohol. Similarly, if we have a ketone, let's say, then upon doing this same reaction, sodium borohydride with methanol, the ketone will be converted into a secondary alcohol. That will be our product. Now, what's the mechanism of this reaction? How does this reaction work? We're going to look at that next, okay? So those are some specific examples uh, of an aldehyde going to a primary alcohol and a ketone going to a secondary alcohol. Okay, uh, now let's look at the mechanism. How does this reaction work? So when you have the carbonyl compound, in the first step, this reacts with your sodium borohydride and the, the reactive part here is the hydride because this is the source of your hydride nucleophile, okay? Each of these hydrogens can serve as an H minus. So essentially what happens is when you have the carbonyl compound and you have the hydride, uh, the hydrogen leaves as a hydride. So it takes that electron pair with it. So that's, my, that's why my electron push arrow is starting from that bond because those two electrons are going with the hydrogen. Okay, so the hydrogen goes and attacks that carbonyl, carbonyl carbon, okay, 
and simultaneously this double bond opens up. And when that happens, this and the oxygen would now have a negative charge on it. And I could draw that hydrogen in for now. Okay, you get that. So you get what is called an alkoxide. This alkoxide is the conjugate base of an alcohol. That's what it is. It is the conjugate base of an alcohol. And now this alkoxide, because it's a conjugate base of an alcohol, it picks up a proton from your solvent. So that's why we need a protic solvent for doing this reaction. So if I have methanol, let's say, as my solvent, then the alkoxide can pick up the proton from the solvent. Uh, there's a lot of solvent, it's there in excess. And that electron pair goes to the oxygen atom. So that's how we get our product, where again, realize that one hydrogen, the hydride hydrogen added to that carbonyl carbon, and the oxygen gets its hydrogen from the solvent, okay? And plus, we will have methoxide along with it. Now that methoxide can attack the boron and that way the boron will get its octet back. And so that way it would also facilitate the loss of another hydride for further attack. So that's why the boron can actually spend all four of its hydrides in an ideal scenario. Okay, but that's the mechanism, uh, very simple. So the attack by the hydride on, okay, so this is the attack by hydride on the carbonyl carbon, okay? And then there's the uh, protonation of alkoxide. Those are pretty much the two steps of this mechanism. Okay, now one important thing to remember about this reaction, I'm going to use a different example here, okay. is uh, that depending on your starting material, the carbonyl compound, and specifically if it's an unsymmetrical ketone, okay. if your starting material is an unsymmetrical ketone, draw an example of it, okay? If the carbonyl compound is an unsymmetrical ketone, okay? Uh, and let's choose an example, let's do this. And what we mean by an unsymmetrical ketone is that the two R groups here are different. They're not identical. So we're talking about a ketone, which is RC double bond O R prime, okay? So it's unsymmetrical because these two R groups that are connected to the carbonyl carbon, they are different. They're not identical. When you react this unsymmetrical ketone with sodium borohydride with a polar protic solvent, you're going to get an alcohol as a product. The double bond O becomes the alcohol. But in this particular case, you're going to get a racemic mixture. Or in other words, you're getting a mixture of enantiomers. You're getting that alcohol plus 
It's an enant tumor. You're getting both of those alcohols. Why is that happening? Because realize that this carbonyl carbon, okay, this carbon here is sp2 hybridized, which means the geometry around this carbon is trigonal planar. Okay, so it's flat. And so when the hydride attacks, right? If I have that carbonyl compound, when the borohydride attacks it, or sorry, the hydride attacks it, when the hydride makes the attack on this carbonyl carbon, because this is flat, okay, this is trigonal planar, so it's flat. So I could imagine that this is in the plane of the whiteboard. So the hydride can attack this carbon from the front, or it could attack it from the back, okay, because it's a flat part of the molecule. So this is what the carbonyl carbon looks like. It is trigonal planar, so it's flat. And so now the hydride can come and attack that carbon from the front side, or it could go and attack it from the back side. And depending on which, and, and both attacks are equally likely, actually, not depending on. Both attacks are equally likely here because there's no bias, okay? So essentially what's going to happen is when we, when that attack happens, the alkoxide that we get is going to be a racemic mixture, okay? So if the attack happens from the back side, then this oxygen would be pushed forward. So it's going to be on the wedge. Okay, this would be a backside attack. And so not R, so we can get the backside attack and plus we will get this from the front side attack. So we'll get both of those alkoxide depending on the direction of the attack, whether it's a front side attack or a back side attack. And these alkoxides, when they are protonated by the solvent in the second step, these would result, right? So these uh, alkoxides, these would then be protonated. These would result in both of those alcohols. So that's something to keep in mind that the planar nature, the trigonal planar nature of the carbonyl carbon is going to give you a racemic mixture uh, of uh, the attack here, okay? So those are two methods. Uh, we're going to look at uh, an additional method of synthesizing alcohols from carbonyl compounds in the next video. Bye.